uh, even after the divorce, like everything was on the upswing and everything was fine. But I was looking at it going, I'm five years into a 30 year career. I got the house, the benefits, the retirement, all this stuff. And I'm like, this is literally it. 25 more years of this and I'm done. Same house, same job. And I was like, uh, I can't do that. Like, <laughs> there's got to be more to it than this. That's when and, you said, I got to turn the, that's when you said, I got to turn the throttle again. I got to crank the throttle, man. I got to shake things up. And literally in one month, May, 2011, my wife and I quit the police department, sold the house, got married and left the country as missionaries all in that month of May, 2011. Wow. <laughs> the Move Entrepreneur Evolved Podcast. Get on it. All right. We are here with Aaron Jennings. Super pumped here at the Move Entrepreneur Evolved Podcast. We're at it again. And he is the founder of Systems and Efficiency Creator for Real Estate Investors called VIP Buyers Club. What's up, brother? How you doing, man? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. <laughs> Looking forward to getting in, getting into this thing here. Digging in, digging in. Do yeah. the old mic check. Oh yeah, mic check, mic check, and tap on my computer. That's true. You got to mic check it. How's the weather out there? That's how you always start quality conversations. <laughs> of course. How's the weather? How's the family? Stuff like that. So the family's good. I'm in Florida. The weather's pretty much always warm to hottish, and we've yeah. got another one of those days. So it's good. That's cool. You? Yeah, we've got you? um in San Diego, it's it's like um we get this October and November, and it's like God just kissed us because when it comes to the summer times, June, uh, living kind of close to the water, you get that June gloom. And once that once that starts to kind of come over, man, it's like when the sun comes out, you're like, God, you know, I think about you know, if the if the buildings were more than two stories, we'd probably jump out of them during that season, but <laughs> Pretty depressing. Everywhere's got one of those seasons for sure. Cool, man. So let's jump into some business stuff. Um, yeah. I always like to dig back. And in the majority of these podcasts, I always kind of go back as the evolution, you know, you've, you've evolved in your growth to getting to a point of having a real estate system business, but that's not really how it started, right? And the majority of people in business look for these nuggets to either inspire them or to kind of go, I can add that, right? And many times people talk about like Warren Buffett and they say, oh, he reads so much, but he has a cool philosophy that says, I, I read a little bit, but then I take what I can apply. So by saying that, kind of going back, um, I did a little bit of my homework. And one of the things I see, think was super cool is it seems that your generational time of what you were, you were a lot into action sports. Is that right? I was very much. Yeah, I raced, um, I raced pro motocross for six years. And then freestyle, just I switched over completely from racing and just started hiring out doing trick shows for like four years. And so, yeah, definitely 10 years there. What was the, um, what, what was it motocross with your parents or, you know, did it, what was that like? Because in reality, if you were on what I would, I would say that you'd say that you were probably on a circuit, right? So if you're on a circuit, oh, yeah. you're running a machine, right? And basically... <laughs> Oh yeah. Yep. Every single weekend I started, my first race was at 14 years old. I went pro at 16 and then we, we bounced all around the circuit. So every single weekend it was load up, head out on Friday, stay at the track Friday night, Saturday night, and then race all day Sunday, drive back late Sunday, back in school on Monday. <laughs> it's the <laughs> same thing over and over and over. And then once I switched to freestyle, it was the same thing. Only we we're driving out, showing up to put on a show and then leave. So, what era was yeah. this? Bubba Stewart was what era was this? Um, crap, man. I don't know. 99 ish. I was racing around there. I'm 39 now. So it seems like 14 when I started was so long ago. <laughs> Dude, what if in 25 talk years? About, just you know, by. Obviously talking about business and thing. And that was really kind of having, you know, that was really where my start was. I started in the core, core industry. Um, you know, we talked earlier, I live close to Temecula. So we got a lot of that metal militia and that got me into e-commerce and kind of started a lot of this stuff. My first store was called toxic lounge and it really started kind of in that, in that era. It's pretty cool. What, a, what a time <laughs> of, um, uh, cultural shift, right? Just mm -hmm. wildness. Like what can we do to our bodies and survive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It really gives you a, um, it really gives you an understanding of what the human body can take for yeah. sure. 
And I actually, um, so I, I started racing at 14. I had started my first business at 14 as well. Okay. Yeah. So I had actually started, um, Aaron's onion blossoms, which, you know, now if you go to like Texas Longhorn, they got those big blooming onions, right. That open up. Well, I grew up going to fairgrounds with my dad and he was, you know, always had his own business and we went to the fair every weekend and sold hot tubs. And so as a kid growing up at the fairgrounds, it was always about fair food. So when I wanted to start my first business, I was like, oh man, the lines are always super long at the food booths, dad. We should do something with food, mm. but I want a food nobody has yet. And literally like that era, I don't even, remember. well, so 14 years old, 25 years ago, I, <laughs> um, bloom and onions were not a thing. I found them in a catalog for like a, um, a restaurant supply store, an onion cutting machine. I paid a thousand bucks for that machine just to cut the onions into yeah. the bloom and thing. It was like this big table thing, you know, that you had to like screw to a table and it was crazy. But we made 200 bucks an hour at 14 years old, <laughs> just selling onions. And then and you were just raising. selling them. You were just selling them right there at the fair. Yeah. At, in a little 2000 person town, we'd set up twice a year for the rodeo and river fest. And that was like how I kicked off my entrepreneur journey was 14 with onion blossoms <laughs> dude what a great story man what a great story what was the yeah. uh what, what did you learn about onions <laughs> <laughs> that they're that they're horrible to peel and it sucks to deal with them pretty much it i mean like just sitting there over a tub of onions cutting and peeling them like a hundred of them so you could sell them out yeah it sucked i only did that twice a year you didn't it was good. It. <laughs> it was good money, but it was, yeah, it's like twice a year. Good enough. So you're, so, so you're, so you're doing dirt, you've done a motocross, you, you figured out a way to utilize a resource that was already there. You also, we talk, we talked about marketing a little bit, you utilize a, um, a current traffic source, right? So in that, at the fair, you went and you kind of sold that. You're doing your motocross. And then something shifted. And, and I think that there's probably just doing some sports myself. There was a time when you get to a point where you're like, wait a minute, I got to kind of have something that's going to use my brain because my body's not going to be able to do this forever. Does that sound right? Yeah. So I had uh, started racing at 14, went pro at 16. Custom painted helmets were huge. Mm. Like everybody was, you know, starting to get custom painted helmets and all this stuff. But the guys that were painting helmets wanted like 400, 600, a thousand bucks, you know, to paint your helmet. And so the entrepreneur that I was, I learned how to paint helmets and I started my own custom painting business. So I learned how to paint helmets when I was already racing pro and um, switched oh, basically so that I could paint my own helmet, right? Save me a thousand bucks, go get an airbrush, buy some paint, figure it out. And then it turned into an actual business. And so by my junior year in high school, I was making $300 an hour, custom painting helmets, motorcycles, license plates, cars. Like my dad had like a, you know, one of those small town shops. Everybody's got a shop in a small town. So I was able to go up there and plastic off a section and paint up there. And so I was, I was custom, I had a custom painting business before I graduated high school and I was racing two weeks before I graduated high school. I bought a trailer house, moved it in next to my motocross track. And I had my business custom painting and I started looking at like art colleges, but they were all like watercolor and interpretive mm -hmm. dance and all this weird crap. And I called, you know, I actually called Bakersfield, California to some paint shops in there. I was like, what are you guys after? Yeah. Yeah. I called out to them. I called out to a bunch of them and, um, some, some chopper places, you know, that were custom building bikes. And I was like, what do you guys want? Do I need a degree or something if I wanted to come work for you? And they're like, dude, show us your portfolio. Either you can paint or you can't. Yeah. I was like, okay. So right out of high school, I didn't go to college. It was, well, I'm already making 300 bucks an hour. I'm already racing motorcycles, kind of got my own thing going. And there was the transition there, right? I didn't want to be cutting onions and setting up and doing all that food stuff forever. And so this put me into a passion project, if you will, right? I could make money in the, the moto space while I was riding and while I was playing and, and traveling around and I could go anywhere and do it. So it allowed me, if I moved, to just pick up, take an airbrush and a and an air tank with me and I was good to go. 
And so that was, that was kind of like took from the food and almost simplified the process, if you will, you know, to where I could mm -hmm. travel with it. Yeah. And so that let me make money racing and everything else. And then I think around 24 years old, I got on the police department and moved into like cage fighting and stuff. All right, let's get going. Now you're touching some <laughs> subjects I like. Yep. Now we're touching into the beating people up category. Now we're talking about beating people <laughs> up. I'll tell you one thing that I learned and we're going to, I, I think we might be just twins. You know, what is that? What's that concept that, uh, what is it? Um, uh, there's another world. It's the multiple world concept where right. there's a mirror, mirror of what you're doing. Yeah. Today. Like the mirror dimension type of stuff. Yeah. You might have my mirror dimension because a yeah. lot of this stuff is kind of going down the same. <laughs> well, so you had, I'm sure we'll dive into the story here and they'll hear even more of that. We did. We did. And everything else, right? The same country and everything. So the great thing about this, that this line is, is that your story kept transitioning and you kept picking up things along the way and then kind of adapting those pieces of the puzzle. Um, painting, were you doing like pinstriping stuff? Did you get into, you, did you, you have a pretty- Not pinstriping, like everything airbrush. You better so have I that the whole freaking, thing down. Dude, if yeah. you don't have that, that finger. Was, <laughs> that was my least favorite part of painting was having to outline things. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I sucked at that. Hated it. <laughs> well, so you transition, it's, it, it, ironically, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's so crazy because I worked for Harley Davidson. And then I yep. transitioned into the e-commerce world, which turned me into the fight world, which now you jumped in. And I don't usually mirror people like this, but at the end of the day, right. you jump into the fight world. And what was that? What was that competition like? Why did that? What, what pulled so that spawn? That? that spawned from the police department, man. I mean, like I did 10 years of high adrenaline stuff. And then at 24 years old, it's that whole, you know, my body's not going to hold up forever, that kind of a thing. I had seven surgeries and, you know, like it was all kind of messed up. I could still ride, but I couldn't run. <laughs> yeah. Things like that. And then, um, so I was like, Hey, you know, I get on the police department. I can pull like a diehard lethal weapon type of a, a gig and get paid for an adrenaline rush. You know, mm -hmm. I'll get paid mm -hmm. to drive fast and fight and everything else. And so I kind of took it along that way. I came out of the Academy and I actually requested the hood at nights on the weekends in a half million person city so that I could not be, you know, standing in a school on the news, but I could be running around at night, getting into fights and stuff after guns and drugs and things. And so that's where, that was the reason I got into fighting. I started training jujitsu, Muay Thai and boxing. Cause I mean, you know, I was, you were in fights and stuff a lot on the police department at night on the weekends in the hood. So that's where it started. And it kind of, I realized I really liked it because naturally it was pushing the body to the limits. There's pain involved. And I deal with that well after 10 years of motocross. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was challenging and fun. And then a lot of the mixed martial arts, you know, they teach a lot of respect and honor and things like that, which I'm a fan of as well. So mm -hmm. it just kind of clicked and flowed and started, you know, refining that person that I was. And then, um, uh, I actually went through a divorce while I was on the police department, was de depressed, pissed off. Mm -hmm. In 2011, the divorce was all done and out of the way. I'd been dating my now wife for a year and a half, and we were ready for a complete change. We sold everything, quit the police department, and went into full-time missions <laughs> and started traveling the world as missionaries. I think one thing that stories like this always have is that there's always an adventure that's behind you. And I think that this is a great oh, yeah. story for people, entrepreneurs that obviously like, Hey, I'm trying this and trying this. It's not, especially in today. I mean, as you're watching today's economy, you're watching multiple income streams happening more often. Now we do say that you want to choose one thing, focus on it. But I think that the evolution of the entrepreneur is They've, it's literally a lifetime of multiple streams of income, things dying out, oh, absolutely. Re re reviving things, starting over. And then maybe mm -hmm. you get something that gives you a good 10 year run or something that you can attach to. Right. You've, you know, I mean, even in the auto industry, they're, they're going, what the heck's going on? A friend of my own is a Harley Davidson dealer. And he's like, with all these electric vehicles, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. You right. just never know the way things change. And honestly, like you said, there's that 10 year run. That's kind of what the police department was. It was five and a half years, which if you're an entrepreneur, you may or may not have this, this history or this learning lesson or 
or part of your story yet, but that five and a half years on the police department, I had a house on 10 acres of land. It was literally right across the street from 80 acres of motorcycle playground mm-hmm. that the motorcycle club had been there for a hundred years. And I bought 10 acres right across the street from it. So like, it was like a dream place for me. Cause I could ride my motorcycle down the driveway and over into the track. Um, I had good pay, good benefits, good retirement, you know, had a big house on 10 acres in a prime location that I really liked and everything. And like, uh, even after the divorce, like everything was on the upswing and everything was fine, but I was looking at it going, I'm five years into a 30 year career. I got the house, the benefits, the retirement, all this stuff. And I'm like, this is literally it. 25 more years of this and I'm done. Same house, same job. And I was like, uh, I can't do that. Like, <laughs> there's got to be more to it than this. That's when and, you said I got to turn the th- that's when you said I got to turn the throttle again. I got to crank the throttle, man. I got to shake things up. And literally in one month, May 2011, my wife and I quit the police department, sold the house, got married and left the country as missionaries all in that month of May 2011. Wow. <laughs> so I'm a shaker, man. <laughs> And if you're an entrepreneur that's been in any kind of a job, you recognize- Where did you, where did you go? Uh, first place, well, we've been to like 12 countries now. Where did you go in 2011? We took off, first place we were at was Katali, Kenya. And that's actually what struck the entrepreneurial um, section that I'm in right now. So we took off and left the country. Seven days later, we were in uh, Katali, Kenya, visiting an orphanage there. <clears throat> and the lady that had been running this orphanage, she would fly back to the United States, raise money, go back to Kenya and rescue kids from the streets. She'd bring them into her an orphanage. She had a school, dorm rooms, a church, a soccer field, you know, a small little um, um, garden, you know, and they had like a few cows running around. And I remember she was trying to get somebody to take it over and she couldn't find anybody that wanted to. Wow. And I asked my wife, I was like, what happens if she doesn't find anybody to take it over? Like 20 years of building this place. They had like a hundred and some kids in there. They rescued from the streets. If she dies on she's the, the airplane, she's the, she's it's the done. She's the god. Right. Exactly. Like it's yeah. done. Right. If she can't find somebody to take over, what happens? All the kids go back to the streets because the money stops too. And I thought, man, like she needs to figure out a way to like train the locals so that the locals could keep running it after she's gone. And that was kind of my first introduction to systems, right? I didn't even know what the heck I was talking about, but I just knew surely there's a way that she could teach the locals that she's been with for 20 years instead of trying to get another American to come over and keep raising money. And then um, just like a week or so after that, we visited the slums. And there was people living in trash igloos, like literally like they bent sticks in the shape of an igloo, threw trash on it, held it down with more sticks, threw more trash on it. And that's where they were living. And there was a guy laying in the mud next to these trash houses. And I'm like, what's wrong with him? They're like, well, he's dying and the government won't do anything. We don't have any money. So he's going to die right there, just laying in the mud. And I was like, that's that's a pretty crappy way to go out. Mm-hmm. And right then I thought, what if I was standing here as a rich missionary instead of a broke one? And that fueled that systems idea that I had when I was Say that again. That was pretty good. Yeah, I said, what if I was standing here as a rich missionary instead of a broke one? And man, that like poured fuel on that systems idea that I had from the orphanage where I was like, they need to figure out how to get train the locals to run this thing. And then standing there is like, what if I was standing here with money? as a rich missionary, instead of a broke one, I was like, I'd rebuild this place. I'd feed them. I'd take that guy to the hospital. I'd drill a well. So they had water. Like the only thing that would change is more people would get helped. Mm -hmm. And from that point, it was a six year journey Ah. of how do I make money online from anywhere in the world? Mm -hmm. So if God said, go to Thailand or Kenya or wherever, I could pick up and go, but I could continue making money so I could stand in those places as a rich missionary instead of a broke one. It took six years of, you know, all the all the stupid stuff of like travel writer and blogger and everything that like makes you enough money to live on ramen noodles and hostels. And I was like, well, that's not what I'm after. And six years later, I found real estate. 
And I and saw that, that it was something around because you it now was I noticed a couple of things. Uh, it was um, Redemption. Was that a, an apparel line that you tried to start? Oh, yeah. Redemption Brigade was actually it was an extreme sports ministry we had. Mm. So when we took off, we went to Kenya and then we went to Thailand and then we backpacked Italy for 12 days. We jumped on a Mediterranean cruise because this was remember, this was still only like 60 days after we got married. <laughs> so like then we 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 had sold everything and quit our job. So there was no rush to get back. Right. Uh, we came back to the U.S. and we, we moved into a camper and we actually drove around doing disaster relief work. And we traveled uh, from Kansas south to New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, <laughs> New Orleans. Yeah. And then we, I had to take myself back to say it like the locals. And then we followed the coast, just stayed as close as we could and followed all the way over to Florida, cut across and then headed north all the way up into um, crap. I don't even remember where all the way up into Iowa, Ohio, and then stair stepped back over to Kansas over nine months and then moved back to Thailand. And so while we were living, um, we went back to Thailand with one way tickets. And that's where I got into Muay Thai, which is another mirror for me and you, Thailand and Muay Thai fighting. And then uh, we lived there for seven months in a bamboo hut, doing extreme sports ministry with Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. moved back to the United States and started the clothing line called the uh, E-178 Redemption. And that was basically the Redemption Brigade. We had sponsored athletes. We had like 12 different designs of shirts. We had hats, motorcycle graphics, jacked up, blacked out trucks. And, you know, we looked like the metal militia rolling in. <laughs> but we did that um, and uh, put on a skateboard competition. We had wakeboarders, moto guys. We had a pretty wide array of extreme sports athletes. And so this was well after the police department and everything else. So this let me get back into playing. Yeah. You know, yeah. <clears throat> and that was that was pretty cool. Yeah. Enjoyed that a lot. What a transition, because a lot of the things that you're talking about, you took on a position that had a lot of responsibility and then you kind of take it off and, and having kind of a common understanding of traveling. What is your question on this? And this is something because you've come back and now you've been doing business and we'll talk a little bit more about real estate stuff and systems. But I had somebody say to me the other day, they're like, oh, you did a lot of traveling. <clears throat> a lot of people that I've met, they're a, lot, they're a little messed up if they've traveled a lot. What do you think? I understand what he's saying because <laughs> I, <can, laughs> I can tell you but that comment, what is your thoughts? Because experiencing things really does open up some very <laughs> interesting things in your mind. <laughs> well, people would say entrepreneurs are messed up too, because we look at the idea of a secure job, right? With a paycheck every two weeks and benefits and retirement and a house on 10 acres of land guaranteed for the next 25 years. And then a paycheck after guarantee, we look at that and we're like, yeah, there's got to be more than this. And we sell it all and take off. Right. Um, so honestly, like anybody who says like stuff like that, like people that travel kind of messed up. A lot of times it just means to me that they're pretty sheltered <laughs> because I think that that's what, I think that that's what his comment was. Right. Because I mean, like messed up is like you're learning cultures. You're experiencing that there's something outside of your bubble there's more tunnels in the world than just to the grocery store, work, school, and home, you know? And once you start getting your eyes open that there are more tunnels in the world, then it's like, holy crap, where's mm -hmm. more tunnels? Yeah. What's in this tunnel? I and think it, that there's something too, and I'm only being honest in the conversation. <laughs> there is a part of me that's a part of me that's because I've traveled so much, I man, what, 15 countries or something? I don't know. And there's a part of me that there's, there's a little bit of innocence that says, man, you know, it's nice to just know your triangle in a way. I don't know if it would match my personality. Right. But there's a little bit of knowing, you know, I, I was thinking about people's lives and, you know, in, in reality, it's usually just a triangle. It's like your home, your job, and then maybe one thing you do. Some people choose church, yep. some people choose martial arts. It's just this triangle that you do. Oh, yeah. now, there's roads in between, right? 
But right. ultimately, it, it was quite a conversation. And I think that in business, um, it opens up a lot, but it makes you also think a lot. Because it, it makes you also think what's valuable and not. You know, I did a lot of orphanage work in Thailand. And after I'd done that, that really kind of messed with me in a way as well of going, did I, do I really need anything? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's like, if you're used to what the American culture is used to, right? Where we have a lot and we're blessed way beyond what we understand. When you start to understand, right? It's not messing you up. It's making you realize what you don't really need, which actually frees you. It's a good point, right? Mm -hmm. Because when we sold everything and took off my big house on 10 acres, that was so wonderful. And I had a big uh, detached garage that would have held six cars and I had motorcycles and everything else. You know, I sold all of that stuff. Well, when I look back at it, I had four, we worked four days on three days off, right? I always wanted to travel. I always wanted to do things. I always wanted to meet people. I always wanted to like do stuff. Yeah. Well, my great secure American dream was four days of work and then three days of maintaining my wonderful property. You know, I mean, how long does it take to mow everything and to fix the crap that keeps breaking on the house and then add on to the garage or repaint it or whatever and then have people over for a barbecue? And it's like, all right, we had an hour barbecue and then, you know, three, three days of maintenance work. And this was great. Like, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Once you realize you don't need all of that crap. You know, when we lived in a camper, we pulled into state parks and literally like you set up the camper and now it's like, what should we do tonight? Well, I don't need to mow. Nothing yeah. needs fixed. There's nothing to maintain. Let's start a fire and make dinner. We'll put the kayaks on the water and watch the sun go down. And it's like you now you have a thousand acres of state park right out your door and other people are maintaining it and you just play on it. And it was I think like, you're man, seeing it. It's I mean, freeing. I don't know what the status symbol is going to be. Is it who owned 25 Bitcoin? I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's a little bit of I'm sure that I'm plugged in here. Um, but my, my point is this, that for many years. I apologize. For, for many years, your status symbol, or let's make this for simplicity, is how you kind of found a partner is you kind of had a decent car, right? <laughs> you know, you had, you had a vehicle, you had something that was attractive right. and things like that. And what you're talking about right now is basically saying that freedom is more valuable than the Ferrari, even though in marketing, we all know in certain positions, the Ferrari helps. But I think what you're bringing to the forefront is that Maybe you don't have to be a minimalist, but at the end of the day, um, it, are you noticing that people don't have as big of houses as everybody thought that everybody did because <laughs> of Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's everybody's fronting, you know? I mean, you think about it. So what you're talking about, right, was when I was on the police department and remember, I was through my divorce and I was dating my now wife. So let's look at this. We were 27 years old. She's 27 years old. She's never been married. She's dating a guy who has a good job, mm -hmm. good oh. retirement, good benefits. He's got a house on 10 acres of land. It's pretty secure. Right. And then I felt like God said, sell your stuff and go to Thailand and help this pastor. I didn't tell her we're still dating. Right. Like the American dream, typically as a woman, you've been coached to look for a man with a good job, pay benefits, retirement, a house, cars. He can take mm -hmm. care of himself. Right. Like this is a pretty secure guy to to be dating. And then literally I asked her one day, I was like, what would you think if we I don't know, just like sold everything and took off traveling the world? <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking She's got to be excited that I have all of this stuff in line. You know, I'm sitting pretty good. And she kind of tips her head and she goes, well, I don't know. It might be fun. I was like, oh, ho, ho, a keeper. <laughs> I'm going to marry that girl. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, you know, I mean, it, like in the reality is right. Everybody thought we were nuts because I was selling the house and quitting the department and everything else. 
But the reality is we could have took off and traveled for a year, five years or whatever. I could move back to any city and go apply at the police department. I got five and a half years experience. I'd be right back on the job and then go get a mortgage and have another house. And I'd be in the exact same position again. It doesn't take much to get secure. The hard part is creating what you actually want. Ooh, that was pretty good. It's not that hard to get secure. Well, I think that one thing, I think that you're right. Um, it's, to an extent. Yeah, I think that I think that what it is, is putting the, found, the fundamentals in place to repeat over and over again, to get to that foundation, and then you can parlay. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Now, as far as kind of drive this in this drive this kind of where you're at today. So as I was as I was evolving through this, you obviously transitioned. You then took it, and in 2014, you sell your first deal, or you positioned your first deal. Are you? Um, it looks like so in here. So let's um, see. Yeah, 30, 35 yeah. years old. So December like December of 17. This was the first deal I got the house under contract with the seller. Yeah. Found a buyer for it. Did what's called double closing and owned it for 30 days. There you go. So you know the you know my first deal better than I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like 2014. I don't know. Is that when it was? <laughs> so, but you're in business. You're like trying to make yep. deals. You're moving. You're yep. shaking. So at yep. that point, let's shift and let's kind of say right. what has happened since yeah. 2014, because the right. transition into business and, and we're shifting. Building, you're shifting. We're shifting. Yep. So remember 2011, we sold out, went into missions and that spawned this. How do I make money traveling? It introduced the idea of systems, right? Train the locals to take over the orphanage so she could leave or in case her plane went down. And it made me think, you know, we need to be able to make a lot of money so we can help a lot of people. We need to have systems to where other people could do it for us or where at that time it wasn't so much where other people could do it for us as much as it was. So I could do it from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And then there was six years of trying to figure that out. And we were back in the United States. We were living in Mississippi. I went to one of those free two hour seminars on real estate investing just to get out of two hours of work because my boss was cool and he'd let me do that. And they introduced wholesaling mm -hmm. and that's where you get a house under contract and you simply sell your position on that contract to somebody else. And right then the light bulb went boom, six years of looking. This is what I was looking for. Cause it sounds like I could do that from anywhere in the world. Okay. And if it can be done from anywhere in the world, I'm in a hundred percent and this could change my family tree forever. That's what I thought at this two hour seminar, right? And so I jumped up and I put 2000 bucks on a credit card. I didn't have, didn't ask my wife. I just went back and swiped the card. I went back. You, ra you raised your a, hand and you walked back. I didn't even raise my hand. I stood up and walked off while they were still talking. I went to the back and I was like, what do I do? <laughs> Cause like I was first one back there and everything. I was like, I had already decided I was in. And honestly, like it's a that's a good feeling, what, right? Like when you see something and you're like, I just want to yep. go for it. Yep. When you know what it is. And when you decide to go for something, go all in. Okay. Don't dabble in it. If you want to succeed in anything that you have, you got to go all in on it, period. So I dropped 2000 Never want to raise pulling off the throttle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Faster is better. So I dropped 2000 bucks. And I think the next weekend I drove up to Memphis or something. It was a couple hours away. I stayed for three days. And I remember I sat there. And that Warren Buffett quote that you use where you just get rid of everything that you don't need. I sat there and they dumped 30 years of real estate investing knowledge on us, right? And I knew why they were upselling like a big coaching program and stuff. But I literally was so focused from that two hour freebie that I was like, if it ain't wholesale and I'm not interested. And I just like ignored everything they said. And it's funny because now I know exactly what they were talking about then, but then it was just like, Nope, that's off track. <laughs> and I yeah. just like pushed it aside. I sat next to the same lady for three days. And I remember at the end, I was like, Ooh, Ooh, I am all in this. This really is going to change my family tree. Like this is it. Like I have found the Holy grail. <laughs> like that's what I was feeling. Right. I was like, I'm going to do exactly what they told reminds me. To me do. Like a Dis it reminds me of a Disney movie. Like, and you're like looking over exactly. the hill and you see utopia. <laughs> like, exactly. Right that's there. what it was. 
Yeah. <laughs> there it is. It's right there. I've looked, I've looked for you for so long. Yeah. So, but that's the way I was feeling, right? And I remember right at the end of day three, this lady leans over to me and she goes, so what do you think? Are you going to try it? And I was like, what? Try Did it? We through the same three days? Try it? This is what I am from now on. Like, you know, and that was the difference. I guarantee you she's still in the same job, the same spot, the same struggle that she was back then. So, so let's I just right out. then, let's just use this moment for like, what was, what did you do right then? Because guys like Anthony Robbins talk about this. There's, there's a statement that comes next. It'd be like, as if I was quizzing you, but what, what's the thing that you do? You take massive, go all, action. take massive action, go all in on it. And that's exactly what I did. I went home and I was like, the only thing I've heard for three days was wholesaling and how to get it done, how to find the deals, how to work the contract. Like everything in my notebook is about how to do this. I'm going to go home and do exactly what they told me to do. Um, I signed up for a $9,000 one-on-one coach out of their program. Not like their big super thing, but I was like, three months later, we were moving to China. So I just put $11,000 on a credit card that I didn't have. And I made the, the, my massive action was do a deal in 30 days and pay this card off before the bills do. And that was my deadline, right? My massive action was swipe that card for 11,000 bucks I didn't have and then go all in, do exactly what they tell me to do and try to pay off that card before it comes due. So and risk, what they're saying risk, works. Risk, like risk plus yep. massive action plus, plus exactly. a plan, right? Yep. The plan. Exactly. There was a, this is what you're going to do to find the leads. Right. And, um, and I went all in on that method. I didn't do 15 different lead sources. I literally went straight to the MLS and looked for properties that were on market for over 300 days. And then use their calling. formula. Yep. Okay. And then they had a formula they gave us for running the, you know, for running the ARV and figuring your maximum allowable offer. And I did exactly what they had told us to do from start to finish wholesale in the deal. And I actually, 2014, apparently, was I closed, 45 days later, I closed my first wholesale deal for 10400 and some bucks. And I was like, holy crap, this works. I had paid off, almost completely paid off that three-day weekend and the $9,000 coach on just my first deal. Um, but two, this extreme clarity of going all in, from day one, it was, I'm moving to China in three months. I have to know how to do this from another country. Mm -hmm. I can't go and look at properties and, and take pictures and walk around them myself. Plus you have a time, you have a time, um, you have a time zone shift too. Exactly. And so there was 13 hours difference from where we to where we were moving in China. And my wife had, the reason we were going, my wife had taken a job teaching English at a local school there just because she thought it'd be fun. And we were like, hey, you're in China. Why not? And it fills your day and it puts you around a bunch of people culturally, right? Right away. Right. Great. Another culture we hadn't experienced, another country we hadn't been to. Um, my daughters were two years old and four years old. So we had daughters. It wasn't just me and her. And I was stay at home dad in China that year while my wife taught English. And um, I was present with my daughters during the day. I got my workouts in at the park with them every day. I was present with my wife every day when she came home from work. And then because of that 13 hour time difference, I would work from midnight to three in the morning, just three hours every night. And then I would get up at 10 a.m. and we'd take my wife to work at noon. So I would get up, I would get seven hours of sleep. I'd get up, do affirmations of my own, read something, do my Bible time. And then I would get up and or get out and I would take care of the girls. And then all of us would jump on the mopeds and take mama to work. And um, we'd grab lunch at the mall where she was working. Uh, her school was in the mall. And then we'd come home and I was present with the girls, present with my wife. And then I'd work three hours at night. And that was it. And three hours a day, five days a week. I did 12 deals my first year and 10 of them were while we lived in China as a stay at home dad. And I was like, I invested 35 grand back into coaching because I was like, okay, I got to keep this going, right? And I thought I was doing really well because like 
I had met with a lot of people that their first year had done one or two. Yeah. I'd met with people that three years later still hadn't done one. And I was like, man, I've done 12 and 10 of them were from another country as a stay at home dad. Like I felt pretty good about it. Right. Sure. And so like all of us entrepreneurs, and I think you mentioned already the multiple streams of income. So as I continued to learn and get coaching and grow the end of that first year of real estate was I need to start a second stream of income. And when I started that second stream of income, which was affiliate marketing, um, and I dove into the ClickFunnels world <laughs> and started really getting into digital marketing and affiliate marketing, other people's product uh, products and mm-hmm. courses and stuff, my real estate business completely died and I didn't do another deal for six months. Okay, so, so here's I something went- that's quite, a, so you basically, your massive action, your risk, everything, when you decided to change it, your income shifted because your, your focus shifted? Yep, exactly. Okay. And this is what a lot of us entrepreneurs do, right? We call it shiny object syndrome. A new idea comes along and we go, sweet, I want to do that also. Also doesn't work until you've got systems in place that make the stinking thing keep running. And I felt like I actually, I mean, like, I'm not going to say I felt like and I wasn't. I was doing really good for my first year of real estate. You know, I had no marketing whatsoever. It was all just relationships with realtors and MLS properties. I had no marketing, no overhead. It was literally like I'd write board, uh, I'd write deals on a whiteboard mm-hmm. and that was it. And it was just emails with a real estate agents. And I did everything digitally from another country. And I was like, I'm doing awesome. Like, this is great. And I was only doing three hours a day. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, like this is going really well. I should be able to bring a second stream of income and do well there too. Well, even though I was doing well, I still didn't have systems in place and I didn't realize it. Mm. And when I started that second stream of income, I did the same thing I did with real estate. I took massive action. I went all in on it. And as soon as you go all in on one thing, what happens to the other thing that you were all in on? You have less thruster, right? Yeah. It just stops, right? It just kind of, everything stopped. And I was like, holy crap, why? They were bringing me deals. All I was doing was like making offers and signing contracts. Why'd everything stop? And at that point, that's where I learned of systems Mm -hmm. and it took me back to that orphanage where what if she taught the locals how to do it so if she died it could keep going and i realized i hadn't been teaching the locals either there was no way that i could step into the second stream of income and have real estate continue to run and if i hired a virtual assistant or a team or anybody i didn't have any way of training them Mm. because i didn't document the way i was doing anything i was just doing it and i And I was comfortable with it. So I just flowed with it. And then I started realizing, you know, I invested more money in coaching, just different coaches. I went Mm -hmm. deeper into the systems rabbit hole and uh, realized that I'm really good at solving problems. And I enjoyed the system side of how do we make this thing work from China? How do we make this thing work from the carpool lane? Because I got kids, you know, and it was like a challenge. Every person you deal with because they have a different situation in life. They have a different triangle, right? They've got their three locations. And how do we make this business work in those locations to where maybe they only have an hour and a half each day. Maybe they have 12 hours each day. Yeah. And what's the level they're trying to get to in that 12 hours or that hour and a half. Right. And so there was this problem solving aspect I fell in love with. And then the creating systems was, When I started looking through the real estate space, Mm. everybody's teaching you how to do a deal because it's very easy to teach somebody how to wholesale a property and get a $10,000 check in 30 to 60 days. And people go, wow, this is great. But then when the business dies off, Mm -hmm. because 96% of investors go out of business the first year, and this is the reason why. They don't know how to train the team and build the systems where a team can continue to scale and run it. And they get tired of hustling from one deal to the next. And so this is where it shifted for me, right? I actually stayed in real estate and started bringing in systems and systems coaching and systems creation 
and realized like that's where my niche was, man. Like every and, real and estate. And this allowed you, to. yeah. And this allowed you to stick with doing real estate, but you also didn't have to go show houses. Exactly. I still never had to go look at a house. Well, I mean, um, for people that are that maybe aren't wholesaling or anything like that, the information yeah. that people are getting right now has a lot of transitions, which are super important, but they're also saying, wait a minute, what systems can I put in play? But you're also sharing something that's super important. I talk about this as well. And that is just the consistency. So when you put the system in, the consistency keeps going and then you can mm -hmm. kind of spit that out. So what at that moment that you said, hey, I got to put this system, were you thinking, okay, I can hire someone else? Or were you saying, I'm putting a system in for me? So the way I teach everybody now, most people start off, right? They're the solopreneur. You're the only one doing everything. You can't afford to hire a team. You don't know how or anything else. Sure. So I always tell people, we create all the systems. You create the system while you do the process because you are the business. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as you get some money coming in, now you could hire somebody and you have the system in place now that you used for yourself that just gets duplicated over to the employee and now they do it for you. And then you teach that person how to be the person that teaches the next person mm -hmm. so that they grow the team and onboard the next person. And you continue working the systems. The CEO does, you know, the CEO of McDonald's doesn't flip burgers. You know, he knows the systems. He dials in the process. He checks the numbers. He keeps the place running. And too many entrepreneurs are going at their business, flipping burgers instead of dialing in the process. And it's so a very good. And, so and what a, <clears throat> there is a science between that piece, right? Because yeah. um, there's a really good book uh, called um, shoot, e -Myth. Yep. 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 Good one. So E-Myth is a really good book. Um, and in that book, he does talk about how systems are being created. He talks about it in the baker shop and he talks to the girl, yep. and kind of goes through it, uh -huh. the method visited. But there's something that, and I went through this in me, my e-commerce businesses, and I think I deal, I deal with this as well. Sometimes I get too system oriented and you're focusing on building a system at the same time, trying to have some kind of intimate relationship with the system. Because yeah. if you don't have any co connection with what's going in the system, then you have to have somebody that has an emotional attachment to the system. Right. And I think that there's something about, and I'm kind of throw this out there, but there's a quantum physics philosophy that basically it's like, hey, if I put, I don't know, the study atoms and things like that, but you can only see certain things at certain times. Right. If you move things, um, it's the old, did you hear the tree if it didn't fall? <laughs> right. And there's got to be something in this energy world. And you know, if you've lived in, in anywhere in the East or anything like that, there's yeah. a lot of that energy philosophy that's out there. And there's got to be something that, that is like, when you go focus this way, there's got to be something that just as an individual, that just conspires to your way. Well, everything starts moving in the direction that you are thinking and moving. Why? And it's, you know, Tony Robbins calls it the reticular activating system, right? Mm -hmm. So once you get focused on something, there's the reticular activating system, which is actually a part of your mind, right? That causes the rest of your mind to find what it is that you've chosen to focus on. And that's the reason that all the big name entrepreneurs that have really crushed it, that all of us look up to. Every one of them says, get super clear and focused on that one thing. It's because when you do, your mind and everything around you starts happening in the direction of that one thing. But when you're focused on, well, I'm going to do these five things, a reticular activating system can't focus on one. It gets scattered beneath, amongst the five. And now it starts bringing things up for all five, but you don't recognize them as quick and easy either because you've got so much going on. So by simplifying it down, like your mind is created to focus on what you're focused on and to help you find those pieces, right? And then it's that energy. Like you were saying, everything has a molecular energy. I don't study it and know all that stuff either, but we know that a rock vibrates at a certain level, right? And people vibrate at a certain level and happy people vibrate differently than mad people. And that's why it's easy when you walk into a room, if you're happy to connect with other people that are happy mm -hmm. because you naturally are drawn to them, right? 
you're vibrating the same, however that works. And it's, 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 it's amazing. I think that kind of pulling some fighting in here just for fun. Right. But the art <laughs> you of can feel talking, the energy of the person, but it's right. forward, right? Forward, yep. forward, 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 forward. You're like, I don't want to go forward anymore. Forward, <laughs> forward, forward. Every time I go forward, they kick me every time. They're like, that's the point. Go through it. That's the point. <laughs> go forward fast enough. The kick can't get you and you're the in. Part the part that you Americans don't understand is this is not the sweet science of Muay Thai. This is how much pain can you endure on the way exactly. to victory. <laughs> exactly. And that's the entrepreneur life too, right? It's not the sweet science of how it all works. It's getting your butt moving in one direction and figuring it out as you go. Your systems come with you and they get created in the process just by documenting what you're doing in the journey. And then, like you said, you can't get too married to the systems because they have to be able to ebb and flow as you learn, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a big difference working in China 13 hours ahead and then coming back to the United States and being on time with everybody. Honestly, it screwed up my efficiency. Mm -hmm. When you work from midnight to three in the morning and you know your stay-at-home dad and you are not going to work while you have the kids because you want to be intentional with them, you're like, if I don't get it done in three hours, I'm up all night and I'm not sleeping, right? Ah. And then you come back to the United States and it's like, okay, well, I've got 10 hours mm -hmm. that I can work on stuff. And so you end up sitting there like fiddling things and thumbing through emails because you have time. And if you actually have less time, it forces you to do what's important and get rid of the crap that's not. And there is a big ebb and flow, right? There's a big change in the way business is done because of a time change. There's a big change. You know, me and you have noticed it, even schedules, right? Mm -hmm. You've got systems in place, but yet things get missed or time zones throw them off. I have people show up at the wrong time because they're like, well, I thought it was my time. It was like, it's never your time. It's always my time. <laughs> like, I don't know why you thought that. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's like you... It, there is that fine line. You have to get married to the systems, but not too married to them, right? And I think a big part of that, like you said, somebody has to really care about it. When I first went into that three-day weekend for real estate, it was three months I'm moving to China. I have to figure this out in three months to where I can do it from somewhere else. And the lady that was sitting next to me that thought, eh, I might try it. She had a good job. She had a house. She was settled in. She'd been doing it for a while. This was just something she was dabbling in. There was two completely different ways of looking at it, right? Two completely different importances of whether it got done or not. Mm -hmm. um, when I onboard a virtual assistant or a team member or anything, the whole first week, 20 hours, is on Zoom with me telling them stories, just like I'm telling right now. So they understand when I say, do not ask me questions, go to the board first, check because there is a system for everything. And if you mm -hmm. can't find it in the place that I tell you yeah. and you start wasting my time, they know that my time is reserved for helping people, not for answering stupid questions because they know it was like police work, helping people, missions work, helping people, Watching people live in trash igloos. It's not okay. Not on my watch. I'm going to make some money and I'm going to change these things. Like they know that's what I stand for. So I'm the one that's passionate about the systems, but I, you have to train your team to understand your passion. Yeah. And then so they can start to adapt that passion, right? I'll even do things with my team where I'll give them, um, I'll be like, hey, if we hit this goal, you get a bonus but I'm also going to give you 500 bucks to donate to whoever you want to, because I want them to get used to the idea. The more money we make, the more people we can help. That's, that's great. Like, that's a, that's, that's a, core a bomb value. right there. I that's think a core that, value for our company. So I want them to do it too and experience it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that um, one thing, and I think my team, had, hopefully, hopefully they would believe this because they edit this. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately at the end of the day, you want them to have a good life with you. You, you we're all together, you know, yep. I mean, it, at the end of the day, I mean, I've had with my team alone, I mean, what have we had multiple kids? We've had marriages, we've had, 
you know, there's so many things that happen. And sometimes you're the backbone of uh-huh. that, you know, as yeah. a team, as a team member. But so why don't we um, just as we start to kind of pull this thing together, it's wholesaling, it's real estate wholesaling. If someone has never done real estate wholesaling, I've never done real estate wholesaling. What is a three step or maybe just like the simple one, two, and three, this is what somebody does when they do it. You don't have to do the details, but just what is it that people are doing that's different and maybe the one, two, and three, and this is how people make money in wholesaling. I literally like dumb it down for people. Anytime somebody is like stressed out about what they're doing, I'm like, okay, stop. Let's break it way down to its core. Find a house you can buy for cheap. Find somebody that wants to fix it up, do all the work and sell it for full price and mark it up a little bit and sell it to that person. Get it under contract for cheap, mark it up 5,000 bucks and sell your plate, your contract to the person that wants to flip it. That's it. Like dumb it way down to its core. You buy it cheap, mark it up a little and sell it to somebody that flips it. That's it. That's all wholesaling is. Mm-hmm. I work with people that flip and everything too for all the all the systems and all that type of stuff. But wholesaling is the fastest way to jump in, make you some quick money, and then decide if you want to just keep making quick money here and there or turn it into that that business that runs, you know. Well, I think that that turn, this has been an absolute incredible podcast. I think that we could go on for hours. We tapped on <laughs> systems. We tapped on transitions as entrepreneurs. We tapped about... Yeah you know, sports athletic abilities, transitioning to mental challenges. I mean, what a killer freaking podcast here. How do they get a hold of you? What, um, you know, how could somebody that wants to go into that or get into your systems program? Um, maybe you can give them that shout out there. Yeah, man. So I do everything with Facebook, Facebook messenger, just because, um, we're in, we're moving back to an Island and off in the Gulf of Thailand. Like as soon as we can, we're headed that way and we're going to settle in there. So I don't want to give phone numbers and then have people like lose the phone number. So as long as Facebook messengers around, we'll be around, but connect with me on Facebook. It's just Aaron M Jennings. And I think you can do the facebook.com forward slash Aaron dot M dot Jennings or whatever. And I'll go straight to my profile. Um, And then two, I, I am a, a proponent of leading with value. So if you're in real estate and you're struggling with this stuff, like I did, did 12 deals my first year, started the second stream, and then it all fell apart and you realize you're just hustling. I have a free five day uh, generational wealth challenge and it's literally generationalwealthchallenge.com and you get the whole five days for free. And literally it's an hour and a half to two hours every day where I walk you through how to do it yourself. You don't have to buy Jack from me. (laughs) <laughs> and then if you want to go faster and skip the learning curve, you can work with me after that. But that's the best way to do it, man. Connect with me on Facebook, go to generationalwealthchallenge.com, get the free challenge, learn something and start changing your life, man. What an incredible way to finish this. I appreciate you, Aaron, on this podcast. You've been an incredible guest and brought a lot of value. Thanks a lot. Get on it. I had a lot, man. It was fun. Appreciate it. Have a good one, guys. If you like this episode, make sure you smash the like button and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just like Nike is to athletes, Moved is to entrepreneurs.